I'm Jenny Gibbs, uh, Executive Director of the IFPDA. And on days like this, I think I have the best job in the world um, to be able to facilitate conversations between artists and curators uh, like Ed Ruscha and Christoph Sherex and Yeshua Close and Allison Rudnick. This is a great day. And to be able to facilitate the installation, which I'm sure you all have had a chance to appreciate, Yeshua's mural at the front. Um, if I am going to read their bios because they both have a lot of accomplishments. Um, Allison Rudnick is an associate curator in the Department of Drawings and Prints at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Her exhibition, Art for the Millions, yeah, woohoo! Alley Fan Club, yeah. Her exhibition, Art for the Millions American Culture and Politics in the 1930s, is on view at the Met through December 10th. And she's currently organizing an exhibition entitled The Art of the Literary Poster works from the Leonard Lauder collection, which will open in the spring of 2024, and which will have some programming in February, I think. So look for that at the next uh, print fair, Park Avenue Armory. Um, prior to joining the Met, she worked at the print shop and publisher, Harlan and Weaver, and she has published and presented widely on modern and contemporary printmaking practices and visual culture. Yeshua Kloss is a multidisciplinary artist. Woo, okay, Yeshua fan club. Yep, give it up. Give it up for Yeshua. A multidisciplinary artist whose practice explores themes of identity, memory, and African Americans' relationship to American labor. His large scale works are created from the intricate formation of woodblock prints representing ideas of blackness through multi dimensional fragmented portraits. Unlike traditional collage arranged from ready made source material, Kloss creates his collage material through wood woodblock printing and monotypes. Uh, Yeshua received a BFA from Northern Illinois University and an MFA from Hunter College, both in fine art. Yeshua's had a solo exhibition at Sikkima Jenkins last October. Uh, other exhibitions include Major's show, solo show, that's a tongue twister, Yeshua Kloss, Our Labor at the Wellen Museum and Our Living at the Center for Maine Contemporary Art. His work can be found in the permanent collections of the Seattle Art Museum, Kalamazoo Institute of Arts, and the Wellen Museum of Art at Hamilton College. He's been awarded residencies at Brick Arts, the Joan Mitchell Center, Skowhegan, and the Vermont Studio Center. Yeshua is the recipient of a 2014 Joan Mitchell Foundation grant and a 2015 New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship, and he lives and works in Harlem and the Bronx, respectively. And with that, I turn it over. Hi, can you all hear me? Great, thank you all for being here. I'm thrilled to be here um, and have the opportunity to be in conversation with this fantastic artist. And um, Yeshu has worked with themes of labor um, in his work for years. And um, as Jenny mentioned, I organized an exhibition at the Met um, on the visual culture of the US in the 1930s and labor is a very big presence the work of that period so the two of us have had a lot to talk about and a lot of great conversations prior so um, we're excited to to be here to share some of our thoughts so let's let's dive right in I'm so excited oh yeah. clearly I'm excited I'm loud too um, <laughs> so I thought yeah let's let's start with talking about this work with our labor which you all have the privilege of being able to see in person up close just a few feet away from here Absolutely. Um, I, you know, with a project that, that's this large, it only feels right to shout some people out because this is not a project that can happen on its own uh, with an artist in a studio, isolated, head down, working. Um, when I started this project, it was during the pandemic. I had a studio that I lived in that wasn't large enough to, for me to see the entire work at once. Uh, so I reached out to uh, an organization in Brooklyn called Brick Arts, which is a nonprofit art space, and Brick uh, held me down. They were so supportive and gave me wall space at Brick during the pandemic to allow for me to finish this piece. So, uh, and, and the list goes on from Sikkima Jenkins support uh, with this mural and of course the Wellen Museum, which is a beautiful, uh, it, it's a gem upstate so please uh, get a chance to go see the Welland Museum 
uh, connected to Hamilton College in Clinton, New York. That is the, was the debut of the Our Labor Mule, and I'm so grateful uh, that uh, Jenny Gibbs and everyone at IFPDA thought it uh, suitable to have here at the print fair. And it is the best print fair. It is the best art fair in New York yeah. <laughs> also. Um, where, where should where I start? Where do we start? Yeah, where? there's so much to say. So why don't we start with how, with the, the genesis of this work, how it came to be, the, the background story, since um, I don't know if everyone knows the background about, you know, connecting, reconnecting with your family yeah. and all of that. Yeah, exactly. So um, this mural came about through uh, reconnecting with my father's side of the family that I had, I had met one time uh, when I was seven years old. And um, that was during a quick road trip to Michigan uh, in Detroit where I met them. And it's a huge family, as you can tell from the mural. Um, but it was kind of a whirlwind experience, almost dreamlike. I wasn't sure if I had kind of fantasized the whole experience being so young. Um, and then I did only five years ago, I did a DNA test that uh, reconnected me to them because unbeknownst to me, uh, I didn't realize that these DNA companies hold your DNA and then partner you with anyone else who submit similar DNA, right? We, we know that all now. At the time, it wasn't even my intent to uh, find uh, similar family members. So uh, that, that was sort of a, a welcome byproduct of my, my DNA search. And I got a Facebook message saying, hey, I think we're cousins out of the blue. And that happened five years ago. So this mural came about um, when I made a trip to Detroit to visit my family for the second time. And I, as an art nerd, I made a side trip to the museum, of course. So I went to the Detroit Institute of Art. And here we have. And here we have the Diego Rivera uh, Detroit Industry Murals, which is it's a, basically a Sistine Chapel uh, devoted to industry. This is, of course, at the time when the automobile was the heartbeat of the American economy. It was a commission by the Ford family. As you can see, Diego's mural has all these head down, faceless uh, white male workers, predominantly. This is 1933, so he was historically accurate. There is a black or brown person kind of sprinkled in there, and at the time, that was a fiction, but it was uh, sort of heralded as a progressive move mm -hmm. by Diego. So I was, felt two ways at once. I was in love with the mural, and then also at the same time uh, felt a misrepresentation of this entire history, uh, this entire American history of labor, specifically uh, in Detroit with the auto plant. So I obviously replaced these uh, faceless workers with portraits of my family members, and that, that brings us to the uh, Our Labor mural. I have some details here, too, if you want to maybe talk about sure. um, how... Whoop, there's, we have a, several of these details, but maybe how, how you... where the portraits came from, yeah. And, um, and maybe a little bit, too, about the technique. Yeah, so, and this is great about having the mural here because up close, you can see that some of these faces, some of the portraits, you can tell that they're pulled from separate sources. So, um, again, I should mention, during the pandemic, my original plan was to fly out to Detroit, pose my family in the exact same position as Diego had his figures, I wasn't allowed to travel during that time. Um, so what I did was I leaned into social media, which was the way that we were really communicating a lot. And remember, that's also the, the, the tool that connected us uh, through that Facebook message. So I started to really lean into that and then grab screenshots and stalk them. And, and that's, that's what you see in the mural. You see these sort of I don't know if disjointed is the correct word, but you can tell that they're 
pulled from multiple sources. So uh, one of my cousins who I hadn't met at the time is wearing a happy birthday tiara and there was someone kissing her on the side of a cheek. I still don't know who that person is kissing her uh, on a cheek, but this, this was sort of less about like accurate storytelling and also sort of more about me bridging the distance between my family and being honest about that distance also. Uh, but also having this need to get them all in, um, in one location for a family portrait. Because uh, I had missed so many family reunions and parties uh, at that point, obviously. So this was largely uh, my attempt to become familiar uh, with my family through my, uh, my art practice. Yeah. I love that the portrait, as you said, has, it's, it's clear when you look at it that the portraits are not done from life. They're obviously very, you know, representational and they look like individuals, but um, the fact that you pulled them from social media speaks so much to this, you know, the story behind this work, how Facebook played such a big role in terms of the way that you connected with your family and then it really brought you to them during the pandemic when you weren't allowed to spend time with them and in person. And that's, you know, it, it's this kind of thread that weaves throughout the work that you did over these years in reconnecting with them. And you get that feel in the way that the portraits are actually rendered in this work. Yeah, thank you. I guess I should also say it was really important to me that um, all of my family members had agency in the way that they were being represented. So I would, it also gave me a reason to reach out to them to uh, ask for permission to use for show them the photos I was looking through. Um, if they're posting these photos on social media, these are photos of themselves that where they already think they're cute. So I knew that we had that covered. But I still wanted to, you know, start dialogue and start to really um, sort of sort of explain my mission to them with this with this piece. And part of that was also my introduction of myself to the family was this became a tool to um, show them what I, what I do, what I contribute, um, and, and who I am. So uh, it sort of worked in that way. And um, there's other, it has other functions like being a diagram. We've talked about that a lot. Um, <clears throat> that the, the mural is structured uh, using Diego Rivera's main compositional components with some of those factory elements um, it's, it's structured in a way that sort of explains some of my family trees. So grandma's in the middle, dropping the motor, and then above her to the left are the four McDonald's boys that my dad was the last one, one with the hat. And then she remarried Mr. Massey and had nine more, and then had one more in a third marriage, uh, Paul Green the baby, at the very far right uh, of the top uh, area. And then below grandma is uh, all of the cousins, all the offspring, of, and, and then some nieces and nephews as well. And a sneaky self-portrait, of course. Yeah. And so Diego's mural gave you a model, in a way, for thinking about how to create a composition that has this kind of, that looks like a diagram, that functions like a diagram. And for you as an artist, undergoing the process of you know, re, kind of reconnecting with your family it also function as a way for you to kind of map out your family and understand the connections between your relatives and all of that in, a, right. in a new way. That's, that's fantastic, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I should also say that woodblock printing became a method for me to really literally carve their faces into wood. Yeah. And in doing that, I think that there's a sort of intimacy that's engendered between the artist and the image because you are committing to carving features and, and face and likeness and, and characteristics in somebody. So I was also sort of studying um, these facial, facial features and realizing ways that were similar, ways that were different. Uh, so all of that was a process of you know, getting to know my family members. Many of them have passed away actually, Paul Green for example, and as has passed away, I never got a chance to meet him. But this was also just a way to get um, all of the family together. Can you talk a bit more about your process? Um, we, which aspects are woodblock prints, which aren't, the, the differences there between, even within your printing method, um, how you kind of approached printing differently for some portraits 
than others. Yeah, great. So this is going to get a little bit uh, print making nerdy, which is, which is this is the perfect audience for that. <laughs> right. Um, so, yes, yeah, some of the portraits are more or less straight up carved into MDF wood and ink, inked over and then printed by hand. I'm printing all of these images by hand um, using a barren or wooden kitchen spoon. Some of the images, some, many of them in this uh, cropped image actually, they're, they're printed sort of as a mid-tone and then while the ink is still wet, I can modulate it with a paintbrush so I can move it around so I'm more or less painting with the printmaking ink on the muslin while it's still wet. Mm. So I don't know if there's a, a term for that. I guess you would call it uh, woodblock printed in hand touch technically, but uh, other than that, I don't, know, I don't know a name. Maybe we could come up with a, a, a name for that process here. Yeah. Do we have any um, suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> Save that for Q&A. Yeah. But, but that, that's the, those are the main techniques. Um, there are other areas like those car, car doors, those triangle shapes, for example, um, that are carved out of MDF, inked up, printed on muslin, <clears throat> and then attached to the canvas. So it is a collage. And you can maybe even tell in the track above where there's some of uh, that, that flower happening. That track, uh, I, I found parts of the mural, like that track, that I could carve out one time and rely on its multiplicity, printing it many times, and then collaging it if there was uh, many iterations of a, same, of a similar shape, where that shape was a triangle, a circle, uh, some machine gear, but I could use, take advantage of printmaking in its multiplicities uh, by just carving once and printing several times. No. Thank you for all of that. That's so helpful to hear. Um, oop, there we go. Um, and before we move on from this piece for the time being, um, could you talk to about how labor functions as a subject here and your family's history and connection with, um, with labor and how it, it's presented in this piece? Yeah, well, so... <clears throat> As I mentioned, that Diego Rivera mural, um, it's, it's amazing. And it, the power of images in our minds to sort of hold place as history is not lost on me, especially with that Diego Rivera, because you walk into a plaza, you're surrounded on all four sides by this, uh, by this fresco. And this is just the south wall. This is one of the walls of that four wall mural. Uh, but that sort of lives in our mind as an image of historical record with all of its fact and fiction. So uh, my family, like many black families, moved from the South to the Midwest for jobs and industry. Uh, my family moved, migrated from Memphis to Detroit for jobs in that auto plant. So some family members are at work today in the auto plant and online for the current strike the auto plant strikes happening as we speak. So <clears throat> this is uh, very much a, a part of my family's history. Um, and that way it's personal, but it's also a very political um, intervention that I'm making. I'm, I'm really intervening on um, the beauty of Diego's mural, but the, also the sort of uh, lack of historical fulfillment that, that's in there. Yeah. Okay, so um, just briefly, um, as, as I mentioned and, and Jenny uh, mentioned in her wonderful introduction, um, we have a lot in common in terms of our shared interests because um, I have spent the last several years working on this exhibition at the Met um, on essentially on the art and politics in the U.S. of the 1930s, and it's called Art and Pol excuse me, Art for the Millions, that's the name, <laughs> and um, it's organized thematically, and one of the main themes that the show deals with is uh, leftist politics and the labor movement, which was such an enormous, important presence in the 
uh, in American culture during the 1930s. Um, the 30s was the decade of the Great Depression, which um, was initiated by the stock market crash of 1929. And at its height in 1933, roughly 25% of the work workforce was unemployed. So unemployment was at unprecedented levels, poverty was widespread. And uh, one of the kind of major consequences of this, of this, um, of these events was there was a very vital labor movement that came out of it. Um, and many, many, many artists participated in the labor movement by using their art practices to call attention to the plight of workers and the unemployed by celebrating common everyday workers um, and even in their own kind of um, in their own lives, in their own everyday lives, organizing. So creating the first artists union and joining socialist and communist organizations. Um, and there's a lot of resonances in the works in this show with, with your work, with Yeshua's work. Yeah, and can I just say, like, as a quick extra plug for this show, it is incredible. Um, I think I took up all of Alan's time that day that you gave, us, gave me the walkthrough, and we had actually kind of planned to, like, see more in the, in the print room, but we spent so much time in front of every single piece in the show, but it's so comprehensive. Even beyond the printmaking, there's beautiful printmaking in there, uh, but just the, the telling of history here is so important. Thank you. And we, we had so much to talk about because, I mean, the more I got to know your work, the more I thought, oh my gosh, you, you're, you're really, um, you know, so vitally looking at this history, updating this history, playing, paying homage to it, but also making it your own. And so... It's, um, it's exciting for me, um, who's working on this historic material, of course, to see how you're, um, you know, tackling so many of these subjects in your own work in a, in a personal way. Um, now, some of the, the prints that you see here uh, by Harry Gottlieb, James Lezesne Wells, and Louis Loswick, these are just a few examples of prints that um, center on this theme of celebrating and um, you know, engaging the theme of everyday labor. And this was just such a ubiquitous and common type of image during this period where um, typically men uh, working in, on construction sites or um, in other kinds of industrial jobs are shown at work. And, um, and it's something that you and I had some interesting, you know, we had some interesting conversations about these, and so I would love just to hear your, your, your take on this kind of work. Yeah, I mean, immediately, again, it, what you see throughout these images is these identity-less figures that are head down at work. And maybe identity-less isn't exactly right because their identity is really defined through the labor. Uh, but what I mean to say is that the, they don't have facial features that are, are distinguishable or like unique, right? So they're in some ways really reduced to their labor. Um, and that's something that I have, I love about these works, uh, but then I'm also conflicted about in terms of uh, the representation of black folks doing this labor. So again, this is like back to my, my own interest in, um, you know, intervening um, on, this, on this genre. But beyond that, also, these, these are just amazing prints. And as we talked about these, Allison started to realize that I have a, a weird fascination with welding sparks. Um, I'm starting to consider, well, you know, welding sparks as a visual device a lot in my work. Um, and, and this was like a piece I think I stood in front of too long as well, the, that last one. But all of these, you know, moments where uh, these, these figures are almost heroically depicted as building America, right? Um, and there's something that's sort of socialist about that. Diego Rivera, of course, was a communist, so he also sort of um, bought into this kind of proletariat concept of the worker as the, the, the heartbeat of society, um, and that the, the worker's sacrifice um, 
of their individual identity was for the betterment of us all, right? And something else you pointed out to me, which I never really thought about until you mentioned it, was that the titles of so many of these works, again, identify their subjects by what type of labor they're engaged in, by their job. So it's just another example of how their individuality is basically suppressed in a way so that their role, these you know, men's role as laborers, as workers, is really the kind of the focal point here, the, you know, the, the important message here is the kind of work they're doing. Yeah, I mean, and I would posit, as we're talking about this, it, some dots are connecting for me, and I also think this is visually where we start to, and this is like a whole other tangent, but where ideas about masculinity start to form mm. as far as, you know, this kind of like sacrifice of oneself, um, even one's health, for uh, labor, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's super interesting. I read that in an interview you did that you talked about how your mom, you and your mom, used to kind of celebrate or uh, you would talk about how, how you started working at a very young age. It was at a yeah, legally young, young age, but it was, it was part of that kind of Midwestern, you know, <laughs> celebration of hard work and, and determination we and all of that. We joke about that now. I mean, I, I, I even joke with her and I say that she used to make me do drawings for my Gerber, you know? But, and I can't say that. Please do not call the police on her. She, she, um, no, but I think, you know, being from the Midwest, there has always been a sort of almost moral position on working hard, where it, the more hours, we were talking about this in the studio the other day, like the, the kind of like moral position about, you know, the, the, the long hours that you work and your commitment to a job over time was, is valued and seen as honorable, respectable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah how um, hard work and commitment to your work and productivity are values that are kind of baked into Midwestern culture in a way. Um, that I, yeah, I, I just, uh, you see that in, in so many of the works, you know, so much work from the 30s, not just of industrial labor and urban labor, but even in works of the regionalists like Thomas Hart Benton and artists who are showing agricultural labor. Mm. That That's right. Yep. Did this? Yep. Oh, you can hear me. Um, so, I, I, yeah, when I read that interview, I thought, oh, yeah, this is, this is another, another strand um, of, of this connection between your work and this work. Yeah, for sure. But I am trying to work less, and <laughs> thank you. Oh, um, <clears throat> I'm I'm personally trying to work less, and I'm also invested in images where there is less work. Also, so uh, not to say that. <laughs> let me be clear. As an artist, it takes work to make these images, but the images themselves are kind of a proposal for. Um, taking breaks, resting, or possibilities of um, usage of, of time that cannot be a part of capitalism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, I mean, the portraits of all of these women in my family, for me, is important along those lines as well, because they're doing so much work um, to keep the family together, to, to hold space for family members, to create these functions that we have, these, all these festivities, parties, gatherings, whatever, there's so much labor that goes into that that I think um, can be taken for granted. Yeah, and that's, that's something that, yeah, I um, would love to talk about in a bit because um, with some of the images of your other work, um, your honoring of this kind of invisible labor um, or overlooked labor, uh, particularly by the women in your family, I think is such a, I mean, it's, it's just such a beautiful thing to, to honor in your practice. No, oh, they, speaking they of women's labor. Um, so we have on the screen here another work in Art for the Millions. Um, on the left, uh, Riva Helfand's Curtain Factory from around 19, well, between 1936 and 1939. Um, and it's paired here with Pablo Picasso's painting, Woman Ironing, in the Guggenheim's collection. And Riva Helfand um, 
she participated in this, um, you know, movement towards um, celebrating workers in many ways. She did do, she made many prints of industrial workers, but I find this work so striking because it's showing women's labor. She is someone who worked in textile factories, which was a very common mode of work for women during this period. And so she um, draws from her own experience to create this work of women working in a curtain factory. And um, it immediately struck me when I, when I started looking at this print that the figure on the right with her, who's ironing with her um, arm, kind of shoulder raised up to the ceiling seems to be a pretty direct reference to Picasso's iconic image of a woman ironing, of, of the physical strain of women's labor. Yeah, you see it here. I mean, they're depicted the same way as the men were. This is head down, faceless. Some of these women even have their back to us, so we can't see their face at all. I think one face is even obscured by uh, that, that device on the table that's holding a spool. Um, so, yeah, and I mean, th there's so much weight in that one figure that you brilliantly put the Picasso re possible reference for. Um, there's so much weight and determination in the pressure there. And then the other woman that's outstretching the arms, um, it's kind of like they're just, they're becoming more machine equipment. Yeah, no, that's great. It, there's even though this is not industrial labor, there's these kinds of um, visual uh, commonalities in a way with some of those other industrial those prints showing industrial workers because of the almost um, like assembly line, you know, um, uh, type of work that they're doing, and even in the way that the some of these. Uh, elements are represented does evoke those other types of prints, even though it's clearly a print that has, um, it kind of nuances our view of labor during the period by bringing in this, a woman's experience, which is quite rare for that period. Yeah, the last thing I wanna say about this image, if I can, this is actually how I look in my studio. When we're hand pressing, that Picasso reference right there, that's, that's what we do. You can relate too to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, one more thing I want to say about Riva Helfond. She, um, so she worked in textile factories. She was also clearly a printmaker. She became a very skilled lithographer, and she was actually hired by the Harlem Community Arts Center um, to teach lithography at that space. And um, that was a government-funded program, a uh, part of. Um, Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal government where um, under the WPA, many art spaces were of course established and funded and artists earned a wage to, to create work and it was a way to kind of um, uh, kickstart the economy during the depression. But Helfon became a very, very skilled lithographer, was hired to teach lithography at the Harlem Community Art Center, and she taught printmaking to many, many artists who, um, who visit, you know, who spent time in that space, including Robert Blackburn, who was in high school when he started taking classes there. And we're going to see one of his prints in just a moment, but as many of you I'm sure know, uh, he went on um, later in his career to open the Robert Blackburn um, print shop, which is represented here um, uh, at the fair. And, um, you know, he, 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 he had a very impactful career as a printmaker, but, but started here in the 30s, um, learning under the tutelage of, of Riva Helfond. Hands. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I'm big on hands. So, the, I mean, the mural that's here doesn't have... Um, it, it has hands in it, but I, I do a lot of work where there's an isolated hand image. So I was excited to see these in the show. Um, obviously, this, this fist we're well familiar with as this political symbol uh, for unity, for, for power to the people. Um, and, you know, I just loved how Hugo is using it embedded inside the machinery, sort of finding a way out possibly. Um, and maybe again, that's sort of like my re my interest in identity and how do we separate ourselves from the labor that we do and define our own identities outside of capitalism. Uh, but hands are big 
hands are very big for me. In my work now, I'm, again, I'm using hands that are not working. It's very important that the hands are, there we go. We figured this out, nice. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this is a piece where, this was a photo of, I, I got this hand from a photo reference that I took of an uncle's hand. And <clears throat> my uncles do a lot of construction work and they learn how to do construction from my dad who taught drywalling and um, building. And so you see the references to construction like that brick, that's sort of like teetering right there on the thumb palm area. Um, and I think there's another, yeah, there's a sneaky brick uh, hidden in there but behind one of the blue uh, wildflowers as well. But this hand is taking time to enjoy the flowers. These are Michigan wildflowers that sprout up in Michigan, which is prairie land after all. Um, so these, these flowers do not need permission to grow. No one plants them. They're just uh, resiliently uh, sprouting up as industry collapses, um, as sites are abandoned in Detroit, those wildflowers are still resiliently popping up. So a lot of that resilience, again, is about the black population of that city of Detroit um, who multiplied the, the numbers there, the population by sixfold during those two migration patterns and contributed all of that labor to uh, developing the auto industry economy there. And here it is, um, uh, on view at the Welland Museum exhibition of 2021. Just, it, I, I thought this would be a nice slide to include just to give a sense of the scale um, of this work. And you see our labor in the background uh, at right. I thought you could tell us a bit about this work. Right, so this is, another mural piece. This is smaller than our labor. Uh, when the parts untangled, I did in collaboration with uh, seven Hamilton College students uh, at the Welland Museum. So the Welland is a teaching museum. They partnered me with these students to create this, this, this work. And an interesting thing you can't see by looking at this, we were sort of organized into uh, an assembly line uh, in the process of building. It was my first time uh, working with so many collaborators. So we had many hands doing many jobs at once. And there was a moment there where I realized I was kind of like managing a team of workers. And it was very different creative thinking than using my hands to, to make the work. Um, but there was times where, yeah, we just all sort of like noticed that the process would go where um, someone would carve, a, carve an image, another team would print the image, another team would uh, cut and collage the image. So we had an assembly line kind of uh, production figured out for this. So th that was a breakthrough um, in some ways in my, in my process, my practice, because I had never worked that way. And um, you talked a bit, well, I'm going to go back to this for a moment. And, and um, when you've talked about this in the past, you have also talked about it in relationship, again, to your family's history and particularly the Great Migration. Um, and so, um, and we talked about, oops, sorry, um, that theme in reference to this Robert Blackburn work. Yeah, this is incredible um, because, again, you have the head down kind of, working happening, you know, the work here is in movement, the work here is, is, is in migration. Maybe um, that one figure is reaching into the water, maybe grab a fish. Um, but this, this is sort of, a, again, that example of like collective identity where the, the force, the, the labor is kind of all together and it's less about each individual component and more about the collective activity. It's also a gorgeous print. Yeah, it's incredible. It's in, it's in the exhibition as well. And um, Blackburn was, we think, around 17 or 18 when he made this. It was one of his early you know, first lithographs. So you can see why he would go on to 
um, you know, start a career as a lithographer after this because he was just so skilled. Um, and um, if you're familiar with uh, Blackburn's work, you probably know his, him as being, um, think of him as being an uh, abstract artist. He worked in abstraction for most of his career, but early on in the 30s, he uh, worked in this figurative mode. And um, you just get a sense of the, I mean, this, this work is just, um, reveals his skill at such a young age, but also the composition is, uh, and the imagery is just incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, and this was made at the Harlem Community Arts Center, um, again, with, with Riva Helfon. So there's a, there's a kind of interesting uh, connection there. And it's, um, it's installed in Art for the Millions uh, among these other labor prints because um, there are really few extant um, prints by, by black artists in the US uh, showing these so-called traditional uh, labor scenes, and some scholars have said that that's because of racial discrimination in the in the workforce during this period. Even though the labor movement was aligned with leftist politics and civil rights um, values, um, so many uh, black men and women were were you know could not find wage work. Um, it was harder for them than white workers during a time when it was hard for everyone. And so to have scenes of different kinds of labor, fishing for example, fishing for survival, survival. Um, uh, it shows, again, a more kind of nuanced and different type of labor that's not necessarily wage labor or industrial labor. So kind of nuances are our understanding of what, what labor looked like during, during this period. Yeah, and I think just as a side note, I always want to highlight that this is WPA era, right? So this was Works Progress, Works Progress Administration a period in America, believe it or not, where artists were paid for their labor, just through hourly work and labor. So um, I know that, that sounds very European. <laughs> it happened here 90-ish <laughs> years ago, yeah. <laughs> um, now I wanted to um, return for a moment to um, your discussion of uh, the artistic process. You spoke um, so beautifully about the way this, this work was made in your process. Um, you've also spoken in the past about your own um, artistic practice and your own making as a form of labor that in some ways connects to the labor that we actually see on view in this work. Yeah, I've always been excited about uh, art that I can really start to dissect the process behind the making. So I, I find, find myself drawn to complicated or even mysterious ways of production, which is probably why printmaking is, has always been really exciting to me. Um, so therefore, in my, in my work, I like to leave behind some of those traces of imperfection, uh, the footsteps, if you will, of how I've arrived at an artwork has always been important for me to leave that to the viewer as a way for them to understand my process, which, which is, of course, my labor and my work to arrive at the, uh, the art piece. There's something there that I enjoy about demystifying the art object as one that sort of just arrives, uh, you know, blossomed out of art artistic genius, and rather something that is worked towards, something that has... Um, sketches, drawings, um, failed attempts, and corrections inside of it. And um, th I mean, that's one of the reasons why I love this mural, because I didn't know what I was doing when I made it. I've never made something this ambitious. I didn't have the space for it when I began the piece. So um, I was really working against a lot of limitations to build it, and seeing it here, I can look at it and sort of time travel and s remember a lot of the steps that it took to, uh, to pull it all together. Um, something else you mentioned um, when it came to your interest in printmaking in particular was that you, you can make multiple images, right, from one matrix, in this case, one block. Um, can you tell us about how that served you in this instance? Yeah, so um, again, these, the car doors in the bottom left, there's triangles. Um, I could carve that one time and print it multiple times. 
Um, not only that, but remember, this is my introduction to my family, and anybody that's an artist knows, like, when you're the artist in the family, people want portraits. You know, they, when they ask what you did or what you do, they, they're on board for you to draw them, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so so I, I, had well, I had anticipated that my family would be interested in these portraits I was making of them, so I printed one for the mural and then I would print an extra one to give to them should they uh, request a, one of those. That's one of the nice things about printmaking, too. Right? That's right. And I can say, that way I can <laughs> say, giving. you can't say I'm stingy, yeah. you know? <laughs> You're getting something out of this. <laughs> Here's just a few images of you at work on the mural. And that's at Brick, downtown Brooklyn. Shout out to Brick. They were so gracious to give me this, this wall, which was almost exactly the size of the mural. It just worked out perfectly. Yep. Now, um... Just to, to veer for a moment to talking about your artistic heroes, your, the art, types of artists that you look to, that you look to now and you look to as you were developing your career. Um, you've mentioned Elizabeth Catlett as being a major, um, you know, major um, influence for you and spoke to about the connections between these two particular works. Yeah, Elizabeth Catlett is the GOAT to me. She is um, top tier, especially lino cut and a wood black print. Um, and I, I have been excited to see the black women of print also inspired by Elizabeth Catlett. You know, there's a, there's a through, yeah, let's. So I think that's important because Catlett's legacy continues. I mean, what she has left behind are some of the best examples of uh, woodblock print and lino cut that we have. So this one, Sharecropper, I, it was just an image always branded in my mind. Um, wasn't really sure why. I knew she had this straw hat that was somehow very regal, almost like a halo. Um, but all the mark making was gorgeous. There's that, that pin that's tying together her jacket, which is very subtle. Uh, which is also an indication of class. But other than the title, um, the identity piece, right? The identity is right there. We are underneath the hat looking up at this woman. We can see and access her face, um, you know, her, 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 a little bit of psychology at, at, that she's going through, a little bit of, you can feel what she's thinking, right? And um, that was always re like really striking to me that she allowed us, you know, that, that personal access right under that sun hat. I love that. So when I found a, a photo of my cousin Tyler with a similar hat on Facebook, I knew that that would be my entry point to kind of like have a conversation with this Elizabeth Catlett piece that I've loved for so long. Um, now, Tyler, Tyler actually works at the auto plant, uh, but again, I didn't want to, I didn't want Tyler at work in any way. So there are the notes for labor, there's bricks that are tumbling off of the, the hat. So it's indicating that she's monumental scale in comparison to the labor that is assumed of her. And also I titled it after her name rather than her occupation. So in a way that was also reference to Elizabeth Catlett, but that was my intervention. Um, I've appreciated Elizabeth Catlett at her time. Also another great of mine uh, is Charles White, uh, who was her husband at one point. That's him. And we really got this slideshow figured out. I'm in your brain. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, I mean, these two are really, you know, pillars in my mind of this kind of stoic, um, monumental black figuration. And in their project at their time was really about unveiling the all the invisible labor that black folks have done to build America. Here I come as the next generation, and what I'm trying to do is um, walk a tightrope where I'm acknowledging that labor, nodding to it, but then also I don't want to replicate more images of black folks at work. So. Uh, it's sort of 
uh, a way to always keep them involved with my work and always uh, shout out the ancestors. And this work, uh, Sojourner Truth and um, Booker T. Washington, is included also in Art for the Millions in a section that looks at artists who are looking to the past, to American history, and bringing their own, um, you know, their own take on it or bringing their own kind of personal um, relationship to it. And so this is an incredible, incredible study done in pencil um, for a larger mural at uh, Hampton University that White was commissioned to do, um, showing the contributions of black Americans to uh, the history of democracy. Now, I wanted to veer very briefly into your work in sculpture. Wow, I'm so glad you did this. And these, this work is just so phenomenal. And it also I was going to force this slide on you, honestly, <laughs> and I forgot to, but you put it in. It's amazing. <laughs> it's such a beautiful work. And it, We're and friends it, now, Allison. <laughs> you know that. I hope so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and um, and in terms of its themes, too, it obviously ties so beautifully to our labor and the other works we've looked at today. Yeah, this is Auntie Grandma. This is um, the largest sculpture that I've done, and it references uh, a few things. The title is about uh, my Aunt Ari, who brought nine of her brothers and sisters from Memphis to Detroit, sustained by her boyfriend's job in the auto plant, actually. And then she got a job in the auto plant, and then everyone else sort of followed. So, um, and, she, and my Aunt Ari was only 18 years old when she did that, so she's like, she's my hero. Yeah. She, love that. He said, he, that she's your hero, too. I love that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's amazing. So she's in many ways, the matriarch of the family. She moved back to Memphis, um, so yeah. But this, this is also a shout out to grandma who, as I mentioned, had 15 children. So there's a branch for each of those children uh, as a way for me to kind of find my way into understanding uh, a family tree image. I had grow grown up seeing all these bucolic, beautiful, symmetrical family tree drawings, right? where the, the trees look perfect and beautiful and healthy, um, but whose family trees really like that, right? Family trees are sprawling. They, you know, a limb is popping out sideways. And, you know, there's all these, when you really start to, like, factor in things like stepchildren or blended families or divorce or, or them, you know, finding me, you know, just recently, right? So, and there is a small little branch. I don't know if you can see in this slide. Um, but there is a little uh, branch popping out of one of those limbs. So there's a sneaky self-portrait there again. Um, and, and I should say the engine is a, uh, an engine that would have been made at the Detroit auto plant uh, in the year I was born. So right. there's also, again, you know, this sort of like reference to um, the individual's identity within the group identity and the family identity. And, and you've spoken in the past too, so, um powerfully about, and we, we touched on this earlier, but about um, the labor of keeping a family together, that work, and the work that um, for, for in your family, um, the women in your family have done to keep those connections and those relationships alive. And um, for me, that was really a powerful statement to see you um, incorporate in your work because there's so many different perspectives on labor in our labor and in, uh, in uh, your other work and that's one that um, you know uh, is, is clearly something that you're seeing but that is that often goes overlooked yeah I mean and that again that's the invisible labor right um, you know we again capitalism is very limited in what kind of labor it it uh, rewards and Therefore, when we're living in capitalism, I think we also tend to adopt some of those um, attitudes. And this is just sort of my way of trying to escape maybe uh, some of that, some of those, uh, or, or try to maybe shift some of that attitude. Um, well, I think we'll end here. Um, but I think, I think we're, 
we're done with the conversation and um, so appreciate this issue. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Amazing. We have a little bit of time for uh, questions. Oh yeah, let's, we can get started now. Oh. Thank you. Um, yes, I was curious, um, in all of your works, and you pointed out already that uh, uh, Amongst the Hand was uh, a Michigan wildflower, but in all of your works, we do see plants, vines, tendrils, uh, the the flowers in the car window there kind of evoke maybe a memorial for me, but I'm curious, do these uh, other flowers and plants have more symbolic meanings to you? Is there a reason why these kind of provide a thread through your works? Yeah, th thanks for seeing that. Thanks for the question. Of course, I have to do that thing the artists do and like halfway answer it, right? Because I don't, I don't, I definitely want to allow the viewer to have their own relationship there. Um, so, and I like to use the word tendrils. That's also a word that um, we've been using more and more in the studio to describe the way that the flowers are sort of active. Um, they're sort of sprawling, right? Which is also another term we use for populations and migration, sprawling. Um, they're vining, they're growing, they're in some ways wrapping around and taking over the spaces. Uh, so I, I look at them more as uh, verbs, you know, than as still nouns of flowers, um, which is why they're, I always refer to them as wildflowers because wildflowers, I think, accurately insinu insinuates the, the kind of um, um, self-determination that those flowers have. Hello. Hi. Oh. oh, hey. There you First are. First off, I want to say your work is amazing, and congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. What came first? Your work is amazing, too, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Can you hear me? I'm yes. To, okay. What came first, your interest in mechanics and the history or family? Um, definitely family. That came first. I've always been interested in that migration of black folks from the South to Detroit, to the Midwest. Um, I grew up in Chicago, so Chicago is steel and cattle at one point. That's what brought many African Americans from the South to, uh, to that city. So I've always been interested in the sort of industry behind those migration patterns. Um, and then, of course, connecting with family really gave me like heightened sensitivity to it and just kind of like seeing how the whole life, uh, a, a lot of it is, is really, has really been situated because of access to jobs. And um, it's, at this point, I don't even think I can separate my concept of my family from uh, the idea of those jobs and the auto plant because so much of that I mean, there's writing about this, right? How labor and capitalism, capitalism kind of organizes our social behaviors and uh, our behaviors inside of the home, outside of work and as well. So, uh, you know, I've always grown up with that because that, again, that's like a very Midwest, um, you know, cultural pr priority, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, for me, it's like, uh, oh, this is gonna sound cliche and corny, it's family first. <laughs> I just gotta say that because that has been, for me, like the thing that made me blossom as an artist. I had been an artist before I met my family, but in meeting them, I felt like I had more purpose. Yeah. Maybe Joseph wants to go. I, maybe I'll go. I, this is actually more of a, a comment than a question. As I was sitting in front of your piece before and looking at it, I was, um, it's monumental, it's a huge piece. And, but I kept saying to my partner, my husband, uh, I can't believe the intimacy and the personal aspect and the intimacy of each and every image. And I'd never seen anything like that before, such a monumental piece with all these very personal and intimate portraits. 
And um, to hear your talk, I see that's exactly what you were looking at. And, um, but it really kind of brought me to tears, the, the, the scale, and yet the, this very personal intimacy. Anyway, I just wanted to make that comment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And you're so eloquent about the project in different ways. And I was struck by, uh, of course, the recurring theme of a loss of identity and a facelessness that you very uh, wonderfully described as, as you, you said that in this case, the identity is the work. And then another instance with that wonderful Blackburn image where you referred to it as collective identity, um, also based on work, but it, it somehow, it made it more humane. When you were at the Wellen, you were put in the interesting position of being a foreman to teams of workers involved in a uh, industrial-like process. And so you had to have in mind a goal on the one hand that's yours individually, and, and then the students working for you. Did you find this tension between the individual and the work they're being asked to do, did that rise during this process? And how did you, as the foreman, come to grips with it? Um, that's interesting. I don't, I don't know if I thought of myself as a foreman. I think that um, I, I have taught a lot in classrooms, uh, printmaking and other things. So I, I felt very comfortable, I guess more as a manager, um, which maybe is primarily the function of a foreman, but um, I'm good at kind of setting a vision and encouraging the team to find their way through it. Um, so it felt great. I mean, there wasn't a lot of tension. There was a lot of synchronicity. Um, yeah, I want to do it again. It was good. Yeah. All right. Hi. Oh, oh, can I ask one last quick question? Sure, oh, sure. Someone else has? Thanks. I'm going to go for it. Thank you. So um, growing up, I, I had a family that had these stores, big department stores. But why I'm telling you that is they hired artists, and they did a big mural on the front of the store. I don't want to say which door, but it's 200 by 60 foot mural. And I'm like, where are the murals on these airports, retail stores? You know. Because your mural, I would love to see, like, so the world could see it. And cars could drive by and see it. So do you have any, my question now is, vision of doing something like this in a public place, like a world fair, or is there like a dream of, so your work could be seen like Diego Rivera's? Yeah, I don't, ha I don't have a vision of this mural um, being public, but not in that sense of like an airport, but I'm certainly interested in public sculptures and public works for sure. That's yet to be disclosed, where that will happen. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you.